Good morning, church. Would you stand with us on this Resurrection Sunday? Jesus is alive. He is risen. We celebrate Him. Let's sing. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But He came and He died and He rose. Those walls are rubble now. Church, let's be seated. Let's celebrate baptism together on this resurrection day. Hey, church, I want to introduce to you a friend who is 82 years young. Miss Janet has given her life to Jesus, and just now she has come to this church to be baptized and to show the world that Jesus is your Savior. Don't just hear it from me. I want you to hear from Janet and see her baptism this morning. Sister Janet. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. And that you believe that he died on the cross, shed his blood, that we might have remission of our sins? I do. And you now, before God and the eyes of all of the, the cloud of witnesses, 
claim him as your savior. Yes. Miss Janet, I'm invigorated in being the one that baptized you today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My name is Jaden Thompson. I want to be baptized to show the world that I'm following Jesus. Yes. 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 My name is Jaden and Jesus has changed my life. So as you've just heard, this is Jaden. And Jesus has changed his life. And Jaden, on the basis of your faith in Jesus Christ, we baptize you today, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My name is Sarah Avery Taylor. When I accepted Jesus Christ, He washed away my sins. Yes. 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 My name is Sarah Avery and Jesus has changed my life. So as you have just heard, this is Sarah. And on her profession of faith, Jesus has changed your life. And Sarah, it is based on your faith in the risen Lord that we baptize you today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. My name is Alden Brockman. I wanted to ask God to forgive me for my sins. I want to show the world that I am a follower of Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Alden Brockman, and Jesus has changed my life. So as you have heard, today Alden wants you to know that he has placed his trust in Jesus Christ. So Alden, it is on the basis of your faith in the risen Lord that we baptize you today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As you have seen, there is water here today. If the Lord is stirring your heart to follow him, may you not leave here today without your heart cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together. We are the church and we believe that Jesus has changed our lives. Amen. Amen. All because of what he has done. Let's sing together. What he's done. What he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is the one 
is good. And His mercy endures forever. And as a church, we stake our lives on this. Let's declare His name. Rolled in everlasting light, Your glory floods the earth and fills the sky.
My name is Josh Burnham, one of the lead. I'm, I, am, I am the lead pastor here, but one of the pastors here. Um, we have been, as a church, praying together for 21 days. We started that with a midnight prayer service, and today ends the 21 days of our prayer. Some of you are here today because there is someone in this church that has been praying for you for 21 days. You are an answer to their prayer. So in this time, I'm going to invite you to spend personal time in prayer with the Lord. Behind me, we have some prayer prompts. And then at the end of our time, I'm going to pray corporately over our gathering. If you would like to stand and pray, stand. If you'd like to come kneel and pray, come kneel. But spend time with Jesus in this moment. Church, let's pray. Father, we come to you through the blood of your only son, Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. The one whose head was crowned with thorns is now crowned in splendor. The one whose side was pierced now sits at your right hand. The one who was buried in the tomb lives again. Lord, we thank you for what this day represents. Father, for the one who is riddled with shame and guilt in our midst, may they be cleansed. For the one who is lost and lonely, may they be found in you by faith. For the weary, may they find rest. For the one who has come that has not worshiped in years, Lord, we thank you that the prodigal has returned. We bless your name, O oh Lord. Father, today, we give you glory and honor for those that have gone from death to life. We give you glory and honor that we can sing words of truth and hope. Father, may our lives never be the same because of the empty tomb. We give you honor and praise today, tomorrow, and forevermore. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior and our friend. Amen. All of creation points to him. The word of God points to him and we stake our lives on him. So we once again, all across the room, declare his name together.
see. Hey everyone, my name is Josh Burnham, lead pastor here of Bethel Baptist Church. We are extremely thankful that you have worshiped here with us, the risen Savior. Here are three things that we feel like are great next steps for you in your faith and here at this church. Number one, this week on Wednesday, we have our first Wednesday night of worship. There is something for our adults, for our students, and for our children. Everyone converges at 6.30 at this location. So join us for our midweek first Wednesday worship night. And then on Thursday, for our men, it's our men's steak night. We will gather and feast on the word and feast on a good dinner. Remember to register for that or you will be left out. So men, we will see you on Thursday. Number two, many have asked, Pastor, how do I get more involved in this church? How can I join this church? How can I make next steps of faith? Well, for you, in simple on-ramp, it's called our Starting Point Lunch, and it is next week following the service. It is a free lunch where our pastors will share their heart and where we get to hear what God is doing in your life. So for everyone who wants to take their next step of faith to join the church or to make a difference, join us next Sunday after the service for starting point because this is where you start. And now number three. In June, we will have a brand new mission trip to Montgomery to help a church plant in the inner city. If you've wanted to go on a mission trip for the very first time or for the hundredth time, this is a great new partnership that the Lord has given this church. If you want to be a part of this one day mission trip, you can go ahead and register now, but join us as we make a difference for the kingdom of God in Alabama, in St. Clair, in the United States, and around the world. Welcome to the church that gathers at Bethel. I'm not inviting you to church, but this is the place or a place where the gathered church gathers together. My name is Josh Burnham, as you've heard earlier, uh, lead pastor. For those of you who are watching online, for those of you who are new to me, we want to say welcome. Just as an aside, we have an overflow room today, so if you feel like you're cramped and, and want to Go to the overflow room. It is to my right, back behind you. It does have coffee and water there, freely flowing. Not trying to d dissuade you from here, but if you feel like you need a space, there is an overflow. And people are watching right now from that overflow room. So for Pastor Aaron and those who are watching with us, we want to welcome you guys. So we're going to do that with a big Hebrew hallelujah. So hallel is praise. Yah is the Lord. So we're going to let us praise the Lord together for all in our midst on the count of three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Today is the day that shaped the landscape of, of history. One scholar calls this the Easter effect. It's the Son of God who lived a sinless life but died a criminal's death. He rose from the tomb on this day. On this day, worship changed from Sabbath to Sunday. 
for the Christians. On this day, Christians had a willingness to embrace death as martyrs because they knew that death did not have the final say. On this day, followers of the way lived as if they knew the outcome of history itself. Church, this is the Easter effect. The empty tomb fully believed and humbly experienced will change your life. It will. If you don't believe me, ask Miss Janet who is baptized today. Ask Alden and Sarah. Ask Jaden. Because they today have proclaimed to you that Jesus Christ and his resurrection has changed their lives. But it's not just them. I would say to you, Jesus has changed my life. The gospel witnesses proclaim to you that the resurrection changed their life. And if you still need to be convinced, would you ask the Father today, Lord, show me your glory that I might know you and experience your love. Today, the empty tomb fully believed and humbly experienced will change your life. Today's Easter message is found in the book of Luke chapter 4. Now, some of our Bible scholars were thinking, I didn't know Easter story was in Luke chapter 4. Well, we will work through this together. The Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke chapter 4, verse 9. As you turn with me in your word or as you scroll there on your electronic device to the word of God, Today's message is called simply, You Cannot Short Circuit Salvation. You Can't Short Circuit Salvation. Hear the reading of God's holy word. So he, that's Satan, took him, that's Jesus, to Jerusalem. And he had Jesus stand on the pinnacle of the temple and he said to Jesus, If... You are the Son of God. Throw yourself down. Because you know you're God, right? It is written that the Father will give his angels order concerning you to protect you and support you with their hands so that you will not strike even your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered Satan, it is also said, do not test the Lord your God. And after the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Church, you cannot short circuit salvation. Let's pray. Father, awaken our minds to behold your glory afresh today. Father, illuminate our hearts to love you in a new way this Easter morn. Father, strengthen our hands to serve your kingdom like never before on this Easter morn. Father, our petition is for the one who does not know you, that something they see or hear will change their life forever. Lord, we thank you that we cannot short-circuit salvation, but that salvation is freely offered and freely given through the cross, through the tomb, and through the empty tomb. Lord, we bless your holy name in Christ alone. Amen. You cannot short-circuit salvation. We begin our Easter sermon on and with a particular lens in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke reminds us over and over again that he frames the story of Jesus Christ around Jerusalem. Luke 24, 47, Luke's very clear. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. Is there anyone here today that's thankful for the forgiveness of sins? Praise be to God. And Luke says that is proclaimed beginning in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of David, the crown jewel of Israel. So it should not be any surprise that Satan, the adversary, takes Jesus to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, 
It was the place where Mary and Joseph took their young child born in a manger in Bethlehem and they dedicated him to the Lord. Jerusalem. Every year, Jesus, along with his family, traveled to this holy city for the Passover festival. Jerusalem was the place, don't you remember, where Mary and Joseph left their son for a couple days and found him at the temple teaching. And to this city, the city that Jesus loved from infancy, the adversary welcomes and tempts the Son of Man. But there is one more descriptor. Satan guides Jesus to Jerusalem, to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the temple is the central locale that pictures God's closeness. If you remember in the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle that dwelled in the midst of the people of God. And in the midst of the tabernacle, there was the Holy of Holies. In the midst of the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. And in the midst of the Ark of the Covenant, there was the presence of God himself. So by tempting Jesus at the temple, Satan was trying to bring Jesus as close as he felt he could to the very presence of God. And then the temptation begins. It's where the people of God found their refuge and their strength. And Satan's temptation sounded something like this. Jesus, if God really loves you, and he does, right? then God will protect you, won't he? Because, Messiah, I know the word. The word of God says that he will give his angels charges concerning you to protect you to the point that not even a stone will strike your foot. It's a very curious temptation because I believe that this is a temptation that hits home to most of us. Because I think that there are some in our gathering today where you have asked the question, God, where were you when I needed you the most? God, when I felt that I was closer to you than never before, God, you weren't there. God, the stone did strike my foot. God, your protection was not, was not there. God, do you even care? If you've ever felt that way, you are not alone. This is the question that Satan is throwing at Jesus Christ. And if you've ever felt that way, maybe that is Satan whispering in your ear, does God really love you? Does God really care? He says he does, but does he show you his love? If you've ever felt this way, maybe today you've come in here wounded and broken and it was an invitation. Actually, you, you think it's an invitation. The Holy Spirit's working in your life. You're not here by accident. But maybe you come in here thinking, I am all alone. I'm the only person in the world that feels like God doesn't love me. You are not alone. But let me tell you, do not believe the lie of the adversary. God does love you. He does. The final temptation occurs in the priestly district because this is a place of public visibility. Jesus, save yourself if you can. Satan taunted. But church, I want to let you know today that you cannot short circuit salvation. Satan didn't know this, but Jesus set his face to Jerusalem. Now scripture says here, verse 9, who takes Jesus to Jerusalem? So he thinks. Satan. But what Satan doesn't realize that as Satan plays checkers, God Almighty is playing chess. Satan is taking Jesus, so he thinks, to Jerusalem. But Jesus realizes, Satan, you don't understand. I have set my face to Jerusalem. Knowing that suffering and agony and the cross awaited, the Messiah has set his face to Golgotha, and nothing could persuade him otherwise. He put his face towards the cross in order to follow the Father's plan and fulfill his redemptive purposes. Now, let me be honest. Satan's words are valid. If Christ desired and the Father so willed, God the Father would protect Jesus Christ and he would not strike his foot against a stone. But you can't short circuit salvation. And in Jerusalem, 
This was the place where your sickness would be carried, where your pain would be born. That Jesus was stricken and struck down by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our sin. The punishment for our peace was upon him. So the words of Satan in Jerusalem to the Messiah ring in the ears of the Almighty God. Look at verse 9. If you are the Son of God, aren't you? If is the language of the cross. The men who mocked and beat Jesus asked him or taunted him, prophesy. Who was it that hit you? In Luke 20, Luke 20, verse 64. If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God, the Sanhedrin challenged. If you are the Messiah, tell us. Luke twenty two sixty seven. 67. It was the Roman governor who spent most of his time in Caesarea Mar- Maritima, a man you know as Pilate, who asked Jesus, are you the king of of the Jews, if you are the Son of God. The Roman executioners ridiculed Jesus. If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself in Luke 23, 37. Luke 23, 39, then one of the criminals hanging there beside Jesus yelled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Would it be that every time Jesus heard these words, if you are, did he echo back to the temptation and the accusation of Satan? If is the language of the cross. But what the world doesn't understand is that the cross answers the question. Listen to the words of The book of Mark 15. Could not there have been a better way? But it was after the death of Jesus on Golgotha that a centurion, now this is a Roman soldier who has seen execution after execution after execution. This is a man that has experienced a cross, that is acquainted with death and suffering. This man says, after Jesus dies on the cross, Truly, this man was the son of God. Does that sound familiar? Luke 4, from Satan's very mouth. If you are the son of God. The cross answered the question. He is the son of God. He is our propitiation. He is your sacrifice. In the book of Luke, after all of this has happened, after all that Jesus has died on the cross, after he rose again, we find on this road from Jerusalem now. Luke 4, Satan takes Jesus to Jerusalem. Luke 24, they're leaving from Jerusalem because repentance of sins is proclaimed in Jerusalem. Luke 24, 13 describes what happens after the resurrection, which is why we're here today, is it not? We are living after the resurrection. If you want to read that with me, open your Bibles to Luke 24, verse 13. This has happened on the very same day where the stone was rolled away. The very same day where Jesus rose from the dead. And if you are here and you struggle with the miraculous expectations of the resurrection. If you say, well, pastor, I, I know what the Bible says, but I struggle believing what the Bible says. You are not alone because there are two men walking on the road to Emmaus who have heard about the resurrection and they are pondering out loud, can this be true? Verse 13. Now the same day, two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Why? Because repentance of sins has been proclaimed in Jerusalem. 
Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, because they were good Christians, right? We don't know who was arguing with who. Jesus himself came near and began walking along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then they asked, he asked them, what is this dispute that you were having with each other as you were walking? And they stopped walking and they looked discouraged. The one named Cleopas answered Jesus, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things which had happened there in these things? And and like a good parent who asks a child a question they already know the answer to, did you hit your brother? Did you eat that chocolate? Because I see Jesus ask, what things? I've never heard of it. And they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet powerful in action and speech before God and all the people, and how our very own chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that Jesus was the one who was about to redeem Israel. Besides all of this, it's the third day. Today is that day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women from our group astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb and they reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the woman had said, but we didn't see him. And if I were Jesus, I would have said, Yeah, I am he. Believe your eyes. Believe by faith. The tomb is empty. So if you struggle believing, you are not alone. You see, the road from Jerusalem is the road of broken dreams. On the very day Jesus rose from the dead, two disciples journeyed from Jerusalem. And we don't know exactly where the village is, but we do know that it was about seven miles away. But here's what we do know. The journey represents a long, traveled road of broken hopes and expectations. Did you catch what the Bible says about these men? They they were discouraged. One, they were arguing. I don't know who was winning the debate, but they were arguing. Two, they were discouraged because they said to this unknown traveler, we were hoping that Jesus was our redemption. Have you ever been discouraged in life? Have you ever had hopes? And maybe you've had hopes in God and said, God, these are my expectations. This is what I hope would be true of my life. And God, my life is not turned out the way I want it to. If you've ever been there, you are not alone. They were discouraged Because the hopes of what God would do in their life did not come true. And this seven mile road reminds us that you will always be disappointed when your hopes for Jesus are different than his plans for your life. We will always be disappointed if what I expect of God is different than his will for my life. But church, let me say this. The road without Jesus is a lonely road. And you can walk the road of your life with Jesus in your midst and still miss Jesus Christ. You know how I know that to be true? Because it happens. But the road, the same road with Jesus Christ is the road of hope. As they were traveling to Emmaus, something was different. It was first, it was the same day as the resurrection. The empty tomb is the road to hope and the road of hope in our lives. And something happens in verse 31 here. After they explain to Jesus what he already knows, and after they explain to Jesus their discouragement. Church, just a reminder, listen, if you are discouraged in life, don't hide that from God. As if we could hide anything from God. But we feel like, Lord, if I, just, if I just hide certain portions of my life from you, if I bury that, then it will go away. Praise God for 
Cleopas and whoever else the other person was that verbally expressed their disappointment out loud to Jesus. And Jesus takes their disappointment and at the supper, look at verse 31. When Jesus takes bread, he blesses it and gives it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. And they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? This is the road of hope. They said, did our hearts not burn? See, you will never be the same again when you see Jesus for who he is, when he, be, when he becomes your savior. When their eyes were opened, they said, something has changed. The road with Jesus Christ is the road of hope. Now, let me ask you this. Did the seven mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus change? It's the same dusty road, same seven miles. The Bible doesn't say that Jesus shrunk the distance. They didn't run a 5K instead of a seven mile journey because sometimes we pray, Lord, if you just take away the journey, I will believe. Rather than saying, Jesus, if you come along with me and in me and through me, then my life will be different. This is the road of hope. So let's go back to the question they asked. Jesus, which I, I just find this fascinating, that they are, there are two men, and they have to be men because they're oblivious. I can say that as one of them. And they're telling Jesus Christ, are you not the only visitor who, who, who's not heard? The seven-mile road reminds us that it is possible to know the story of Easter and miss the Savior of Easter. Most of us know that story, don't we? Many of you could tell the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection better than me. But be careful not to know the story and to miss the Savior. This is the road of faith. And we gather today on Easter where everyone knows the story. And may we not miss the fact that the Emmaus walk was the same day as the resurrection. So I'm going to ask you today the question that these men asked Jesus. Are you the only visitor today who does not know the things which has happened? Now, you might say, well, Pastor, of course I know them. I know Jesus died on the cross. I know that he was scourged. I know that he wore a crown of thorns. I know that they gambled over his clothes. I know that he is the Passover lamb. I know that he is the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Pastor, I know this. I know. I'm asking, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Because you cannot short circuit salvation. Romans says that faith comes from what is heard and what is heard comes from the message about Jesus Christ. Do you believe this for yourself? See, anyone can take Jesus to the temple, Satan. Anyone can ask him, are you really the son of God? But Satan did not believe it to be true. And little did Satan know that what he said was true. Jesus could save himself, but he could not save himself and save you at the same time. And so when Jesus refused to throw himself in the pinnacle of the temple, he was in essence saying to Satan in Jerusalem, Satan, one day I will give my life for Josh. You don't understand that? Satan, you will never believe that. But Satan, I choose not to save myself. I will save others. Jesus died in Jerusalem because he is the son of God. He rose again because he is the son of God. And he did that for you and I. He could not save himself and us simultaneously. So he gave his life freely for guilty sinners. 
Praise be to God for this temptation. Because if is the language of the cross. How would you answer the question, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem that does not know these things? When you arrive, we gave you a survey. We're going to ask you before you leave later today to answer that honestly. Maybe today is the first time that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. For the first time, your eyes have been opened and you see Jesus for who he is and you say, God, I've heard the story. I know what you did. I know Jerusalem, but God, for the first time, I need you as my Lord and Savior. Would you by faith trust in Jesus Christ? Maybe you feel like that your sins are too great to be redeemed. That's not true. Don't believe Satan. Because Jesus paid the price of your redemption on the cross. And I know that that price was accepted because he rose again. If Jesus did not pay the price in full, he would not have been resurrected from the grave. His price for your sake was paid in full. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, this is the first time I've been in church in years. And I'm ashamed of that. And I need forgiveness. I need cleansing. Now I want you to know today that the Bible says if you confess your sins to God, He is faithful and He is just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Maybe for you, your next step of faith is simply, God, I want to live like you like never before. We're going to ask you to get real with the Lord today. And as you exit later, to put that in the offering basket, and our pastors will prayerfully look over every single one. If you've given your life to Christ, we will follow up with you. If you say, Pastor, I want someone to reach out to me, we will follow up with you. If today you need to give your life to Christ, don't fill out a survey. Run to Jesus. Don't run to a pastor. Don't run to a church. Don't run down an aisle. Run to the cross and say, Father, forgive me. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not an if anymore for me. I believe. I believe he rose again. It's not an if anymore for me. I believe. Father, will you forgive me? And the answer from heaven to the prayer of the penitent heart is always, Josh, I never thought you would ask. Of course, I forgive you. My son paid the price for your forgiveness. My son washes you clean. His blood was shed for the remission of your sins. His body was broken for you. Would you cry out to God today? In a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Bible doesn't say to us how the guest on the road became the host of the home. But somewhere between the Emmaus Road and verse 30, Jesus takes over. There's not a more glorious thought than to know that Jesus takes over our lives. And as he reclined at the table, he took the bread, blessed it, and he gave it to them and he broke it. And their eyes were opened. What is unique about King Jesus is that he revealed himself at a table. They weren't in the synagogue or the temple. They were around a table and their eyes were opened. And maybe for you, you have seen God reveal himself along a road or maybe along one of the most basic moments of life in a garden, in a house, or in a house of worship. There is no wrong place to meet Jesus Christ. Praise be to God that his son is not beneath sitting at the table with us. So as we come to the table shortly, may our hearts burn within us once again. For all who have professed faith in Jesus Christ and been publicly baptized, today's communion is your holy response to God's grace upon you. Miss Janet, are you here today? I don't see you. Right there. She didn't raise her hand. They're pointing you out. Miss Janet, she's giving me the finger. (laughs) 
You're one of the few that can point at me like that. You are our welcome guest at the table today. Alden, you are our welcome guest. Where's Jaden? Is Jaden here? Jaden's up top. Jaden, you are our welcome guest at the table of the Lord. Where's Sarah Avery? Sarah, you are our welcome guest. Church, we have more at the table. This is the power of the resurrection. In a moment, as we sing and as we confess our sins, when you are ready, you can come forward. And then it, as you gather the elements, if you would go back to your seat, because we will eat in unity. And I'm going to ask those who are baptized today, you can go ahead and make your way forward. We will serve you first because you are our guest at the table of the Lord. Let me pray. Father, for those that need you for the first time, Lord, may they cry out to you. A prayer of faith. Lord, give them the boldness to say something like this. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Today, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Today, I believe his body was broken for me. Today, I believe his blood was shed for my forgiveness. Today, I will follow Jesus no matter the cost. Lord, thank you for hearing their prayer of salvation. Father, for those who know you, bless us. Keep us. Shine your face upon us. And as we come to the table, Lord, may our hearts burn within us once again and open our eyes to behold your glory. Father, we praise your holy name for the resurrection. We praise your holy name for the cross. And we praise your holy name that salvation was not short-circuited. Lord, we bless you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, won't you come? Our pastors will be down front to receive you and pray with you if you so need. And our deacons will be here to serve you.
says that on the night in which the Messiah was betrayed, he took bread, the matzah bread, bread that was pierced, bread that was scored and striped, and bread that is unleavened without sin. And he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Church, before we eat, let us bless the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you that your son was the sacrifice that we needed for salvation. Lord, you gave us your best gift whose body was broken. Lord, we praise your holy name as we eat. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, may we eat together. In like manner, Jesus took the cup, which had been the third cup of that meal, the cup of redemption. Because his blood is the redemption of our sins. Let me bless before we drink. Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus, our Messiah, was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. So Lord, today we drink with tears, but we drink with joy. Because our salvation had great cost. We thank you, Lord. We glorify you, Father. And we drink in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Today, if you would say, well, I need what those people had. I need Jesus. Our pastors will stay down front. We would love to have that conversation with you. We also have some resources at the connection table. If you're new, they would like to meet you. And if you want to give to further the kingdom work of this local church, you can give online like many of you do, or you can give in the the worship baskets 
in the lobby. That's also the place where you can put your Easter survey. Let me remind you that we hear your voice. We will preach later in this year on the basis of that survey. We want to help point you to Jesus Christ on the basis of your survey. But before we leave, may we leave with these words. Where the Emmaus disciples said, weren't our hearts burning within us? May that be the theme of our song as we leave for Easter. When we gather, Lord, weren't our hearts burning within us? Because the tomb is empty. Church, he is risen. He is risen indeed. May the Lord bless you. You are dismissed.